Yes. We have the honor today of having Dr. Rod Skuyan. Dr. Skuyan is chief of the complex spine department at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute, president and CEO of the Seattle Science Foundation and co-director of the Minimal Invasive Complex Spine Fellowship. Right now at the IWBSC, Dr. Skuyan is going to share a lecture on advanced approaches to the spine. Please type right your questions in the Q&A panel. We will read them after the end of Dr. Esquian's intervention. Welcome, Dr. Esquian, and thank you. It's all yours. Great. <clears throat> thank you so much for um, allowing me to present. Um, and uh, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to discuss um, one of my favorite topics, which is um, doing lateral surgery and doing uh, complex revisions. So today I'm gonna sort of walk through several, um, I think key aspects of doing lateral surgery. Uh, the first one being that anatomy is very important. And then the second is to really look at the spine um, in a different, uh, viewpoint or different perspective um, and to really try to look at it as a three-dimensional structure. Um, I know historically, um, you know, we've done everything from one or two approaches and this is really looking at the spine from a different angle um, and uh, I think the lateral approach really uh, gives you um, access to the spine uh, in such a way that um, it allows you to do really some um, uh, significant corrections, um, tumor pathology, trauma, corpectomies, um, in addition, um, both look, uh, establishing lumbar lordosis and um, uh, achieving spinal balance. And actually, it's a different paradigm. I think when you go anterior, you have the ability to lengthen the spine um, by working in the disc space rather than shorten it, which is what historically we've done. Um, and uh, um, I've had the, um, the unique opportunity to start uh, in the lateral space early on. In fact, um, being one of the original uh, lateral surgeons um, back in uh, the mid 2000s, from 2006 to 2008, when the procedure really uh, was in its infancy. So I'm gonna go over um, uh, uh, a couple important aspects. Um, here are my disclosures. Um, I'm a consultant for these various companies um, and get royalties. Um, uh, this is not gonna obviously uh, affect the talk itself. Um, and um, this is an example of uh, a deformity case that, I, that I'm just putting up for the audience. And this is what we deal with um, in spine surgery, is you have a three-dimensional um, problem. And uh, oftentimes we sort of have two-dimensional um, imaging, we have two-dimensional x-rays, um, even our nomenclature and the way we sort of view uh, spinal deformity historically has been in, in, in two planes. So, you know, people sort of look at it as a both sagittal and coronal deformity. The concept of uh, um, uh, spinal balance um, really doesn't take into these other effects. Um, you know, we've more recently in the last um, decade, we started looking at the hip, we looked at the sacrum, the pelvis, pelvic incident, sacral slope. But again, I think, you know, when you look at a deformity like this, this patient has a significant rotatory component. Um, you can see on this AP uh, X-ray. Um, uh, you, um, you can see the pedicles are rotated. Um, uh, you see the spinous processes are um, rotated. Um, you can see the end plates aren't um, necessarily in line with each other. And you can see 
um, starting from L5 all the way up to T, T10 and T9, there's a significant um, curvature. And again, this is a thoracolumbar deformity. Um, and historically, you know, when we've done spinal deformity surgeries, we have um, uh, shortened the spine. We've gone posterior. And a lot of our corrective procedures or techniques involve resection of vertebral bodies um, and uh, vertebrectomies, vertebral um, body resections. And um, in addition, uh, we also do pedicle subtraction osteotomies and um, uh, vertebral column resections, posterior Smith-Peterson osteotomies, Ponte osteotomies. So it's really, you know, when you look at a case like this, um, how can you rethink how we do corrective procedures? Um, and again, when you're thinking about minimally invasive surgery, um, you really, the whole concept is you want to try to do the minimal amount of disruption. Um, some of the downsides to doing minimally invasive surgery is you have a significant amount of fluoroscopic exposure. The learning curve on doing a case like this is very steep. It takes um, several hundred cases to do to get really familiar with an approach such as lateral surgery. Um, and again, the anatomy, you really have to start to rethink um, and uh, consider the um, anatomical structures in a three-dimensional manner. Um, and uh, um, that's kind of um, one of the most important things about doing lateral surgery. One of the other things um, that we'll discuss today is, you know, what are the relevant structures? So if you're gonna do lateral surgery, you're gonna work in a space that historically as neurosurgeons, we have not, and orthopedic surgeons, have not had a significant amount of exposure to. So for example, um, what are the contents in this retroperitoneal space? And what are the structures at risk? So most of us kind of worry about the lumbar plexus and the psoas muscle, which you can see nicely illustrated here. Um, these are both uh, structures that are retroperitoneal um, and uh, uh, again, um, this is uh, new for neurosurgery. It's new for orthopedics. Historically, you know, urologists would be working this area because you can um, uh, access the kidney through this approach. Um, and uh, again, um, some of the other structures are the vasculature, you have the sympathetic chain, you've got the iliac vein and arteries the um, inferior, inferior vena cava, the aorta itself. Um, and these are all structures that historically um, we've never really had to worry about or uh, be concerned with because this is not an area that typically that um, uh, as neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons um, we get into. So um, having said that, um, uh, we also want to discuss the chest cavity because um, when you do lateral surgery, this gives you access to the, the chest wall as well. Um, and um, uh, there's the same, same uh, anatomical structures uh, that um, we uh, approach in the uh, lumbar area are uh, concerned in the chest. So you have um, the lung, you've also got um, the uh, uh, vascular anatomy. Um, in addition, now you're in the chest cavity, so you've got to be concerned about the diaphragm. Um, in addition, you've got the large segmental arteries. Um, and um, uh, and uh, again, um, you're in the chest cavity, so you've got to deal with the lung. So do you drop the lung? Do you leave the um, uh, lung up? Um, and um, these are all uh, uh, new areas that historically we've, we have not had to go into. 
um, when you're doing lateral surgery. And one of the most important structures um, that oftentimes we encounter when we're doing um, lumbar approaches is the lumbar plexus. So um, understanding the lumbar plexus is paramount. So although we use neuromonitoring, you really have to understand what it is um, and uh, the um, lumbar plexus I'm using, there's some old anatomical textbooks um, and uh, you know these are diagrams, which I would say were drawn probably a couple hundred years ago. And although they're very crude, this is not exactly what it looks like in real life. And just to show you the difference between the, the cadaver um, and uh, our anatomical textbooks, which we use during medical school, um, uh, you can see um, there's, a, there's a significant difference. Um, and um, you can see, for example, here, we've got an anatomical specimen and you can see the plexus, you can see the kidney, you can see um, this is sort of in the thoracolumbar junction, so you see the 12th rib, and you can see how complex the um, structures are. And this is what the psoas uh, muscle removed. Um, so um, again, uh, this is an area, you know, when I started doing um, lateral surgery, people really didn't understand the lumbar plexus. Um, we were seeing um, injuries uh, from the approach and we'd seen in multiple nerve roots. Um, and uh, this um, uh, can be quite challenging to deal with uh, when you have a complication of the femoral nerve. Um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, what does that look like after surgery? Um, and so uh, that's kind of what we're dealing with is, is when you do lateral surgery, for me, understanding this anatomy is very important. Um, and again, most of the textbooks that we have kind of uses cartoon character where, you know, they show these nerves and they show them exiting the lumbar plexus. And then you can see it's got the psoas as a separate structure almost. Um, and that's not how um, um, it is in real life. Um, in real life, uh, the plexus, this is what the psoas completely removed, is intimately integrated with the lumbar plexus and its nerve um, and, uh, and its innervations. Um, and although there are branches of the plexus that innervate the psoas, um, the uh, majority of the lumbar plexus is actually in the psoas uh, itself. Um, and uh, um, uh, this is, you know, again, the, these are textbooks that I got from my medical school anatomy class. Um, and uh, this is what we're taught. So you can see here, this is completely um, different than what it's like um, in, in real life. Um, so uh, this is important to understand because if you're going to do um, uh, lateral surgery, you have to understand the nuances of doing, for example, an L4-5 interbody fusion. Um, and again, this is sort of another typical, you know, anatomical depiction of, of showing, okay, um, these are the branches of the lumbar plexus, but it doesn't show the psoas muscle. It doesn't show the disc space. Um, it doesn't show the actual complex three-dimensional um, uh, architecture of the plexus in the psoas. And you can see again, um, we have an anatomical specimen on one side and the anatomical uh, cartoon-like um, figure on the other side. You can see they're completely different. So when we started doing, when I started doing lateral surgery, we actually spent a lot of time with cadavers. Um, we spent time in the lab you really have to understand these complex relationships. For example, if you're gonna do a lateral procedure at 045, it's a completely different approach than um, doing an A-lift. It's a different approach than doing a T-lift. And you, you have to navigate 
through the lumbar plexus without injuring it. Um, and again, in each level at L45, it's, it's different um, than um, L34 and different than L23. So these are all very important um, uh, anatomical um, corridors that we use. Um, and uh, again, um, when you look at it from uh, a cadaveric specimen and compare it to what we're taught, you can again see this, this um, uh, figure is, is completely wrong. It's showing the plexus as a separate entity. It's got the sympathetic chain. Um, this is incorrect. Um, the only thing that's correct here is it's got the general femoral nerve on top of the psoas. But what we're taught in medical school and what's in real life is totally different. And again, when you're doing a lateral approach, you've got, for example, the subcostal nerves, you get the iliohypogastric nerve, you've got um, a lot of both sensory and motor nerves that go um, in uh, the, in, that go through the internal oblique, external oblique. And so you can't cut these nerves. These are all important nerves. Um, and you have to carefully um, use minimally uh, disruptive approaches. So you don't want to use a bovie when you're going down. Um, you don't want to cut any of these structures because guess what? They have important innervation to different muscles um, and, and as well as uh, sensory components. So here's a actual 3D reconstruction of the cadaver with the nerves. And you can see how complex this is. Um, and uh, you can see it's, it's just, it's a web of um, nerves that go through the lumbar spine. Um, and uh, uh, you can see the complexity of um, these nerves, particularly around L4-5 and L3-4. And uh, this is another nice anatomical specimen. We use some um, uh, uh, endovascular uh, K-wires here to show the different branches. We have the general femoral nerve, the ilioinguinal nerve, the subcostal nerve, the obturator, the femoral. And then you can see this is an AP view, um, which is quite different than what it looks like if you go lateral. So here's a lateral view. You can see these separate nerves. You can see it starts to get really hairy at L4-5 and L3-4. And um, we published quite a bit on this. Um, and uh, there's been um, a lot of uh, uh, excellent work that's been done by other groups that really focus on trying to um, uh, illustrate and demonstrate um, the uh, plexus and its relationship to the disk space. And although each person is um, quite different um, in their anatomy, um, the general architecture and framework of um, uh, this um, relationship is quite, um, uh, uh, it's um, quite common to have them, um, you know, for example, if you're doing L45, it's quite common to have a femoral nerve sort of right going right in the middle of the disc space. So these are all important um, distinctions that you have to understand. Um, and here's a very nice anatomical picture that demonstrates exactly what I'm referring to. So you can see this is the lumbar plexus. This is what it looks like in real life. We've taken the psoas major off. We've left some of the fibers of the psoas major on, and you can see the complex relationship of the transverse process there. You have the femoral nerve coming here. You've got different um, sensory and motor branches that have interconnections. Um, and then you've got, this is the L2-3 disk space, this is the L3-4 disk space. And then we're looking at the L4-5 disk space, and you can see the femoral nerve is going right through the area um, of interest. And um, you can see if you're gonna do a lateral approach that um, you're really not going to be able to manipulate or move that femoral nerve. 
And so understanding that this is a fixed structure, understanding that um, uh, if you're going to do an L45 um, inner body fusion here or do a corrective procedure or do a corpectomy, you're going to have to go anterior to the disc base at this level. Understanding that relationship is paramount. Um, and even with the best neuromonitoring techniques um, and uh, all the nice um, uh, advancements that we've made in the last decade um, in intraoperative navigation, um, this is still um, a well-known complication of doing this approach. And so you really have to understand um, these relationships and be cognizant of um, what complications you can have at what level. And um, uh, again, you can see we put some color codes here. You can see this is the L34 disk space. That's L45. Um, and uh, the vertebral bodies um, are in between. Um, and you can see the femoral nerve and the lumbar plexus and its relationship to these areas. Um, uh, and um, again, um, when I started doing lateral surgery, we really didn't have a lot of good intraoperative um, neuromonitoring uh, uh, technology at the time. And so we used a lot of, um, I used a microscope actually on every case. And I would just go down, I would go through layer by layer in the psoas muscle, identify the femoral nerve, and um, once the femoral nerve was identified, I then went ahead and placed my retractor anterior to the femoral nerve um, and then started to do my work. Um, having done several hundred of those in that fashion, um, uh, we realized that there had to be a better way to do it. And so um, uh, we worked on developing new retractor systems, new neuromonitoring systems, and um, uh, because we could see how powerful this approach was um, and how much correction you can do um, from a lateral approach. And again, if you're doing lateral surgery, this gives you a whole new corridor to doing deformity correction. Um, you're working in avascular uh, disc space um, and um, uh, uh, this allows you to um, uh, do a significant amount of correction with minimal disruption. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's a very um, uh, excellent um, corridor to do a lot of uh, corrective procedures. So this is a very nice 75-year-old gentleman who I had taken care of, who had multiple um, lumbar laminectomies, um, actually, uh, his son brought him to the U.S. Uh, the, the last surgery that he had, he ended up having a, um, a dural CSF leak, developed meningitis, was placed on bed rest, um, and um, he'd had six or seven um, decompressive procedures. Um, when I had seen him, um, the patient actually had difficulty standing um, and uh, difficulty getting around was neurologically intact um, uh, and um, uh, um, when I saw the patient in clinic, his main complaint was not being able to stand upright and um, really could not um, walk um, very far. He had to lay down um, uh, after um, attempting to walk upright. Um, these are his MRIs and his uh, CT scan. You can see he had a very extensive lumbar laminectomy. Um, in fact, um, the facet joints were completely removed. Um, this is a CT scan, so the patient lying down. Um, and then this is the MRI. This is a great example of um, how, you know, if you're gonna do a corrective procedure on this patient, you really have to um, get appropriate um, uh, x-rays. X-rays are still very valuable. Um, and so if you just look at the MRI and CT scan, you don't think that the patient has um, that much of a problem. Um, and uh, uh, so 
Um, we got some x-rays of this patient. You can see there's a significant deformity here. Um, there's instability between L3, 4, and L4, 5. You can see the rest of his spine, um, uh, both in an AP and lateral view, um, look okay, but the main areas are in the um, low lumbar spine. And so when you start to think about doing a corrective procedure on this patient, um, you know, do you do a, a posterior T lift? You could do an A lift, you can do an O lift, you can do an X lift, you can go lateral, you can go anterior, um, or you can try to go posterior. Um, having gone posterior in a lot of these cases um, and having a patient who previously had multiple lumbar surgeries, I uh, think going lateral in a patient like this is um, gives you a lot more um, opportunity to do correction. In addition, um, it gives you access to an area that's not had surgery before, so it's easier um, to, to access. So we um, did a, basically a two-stage procedure where we went lateral um, and then we went posterior. And you can see how much the patient subluxed on flexion extension imaging. Um, and again, here, here's on flexion and there's on extension. And again, this patient um, is, uh, has significant comorbidities, um, has had multiple surgeries. And um, I thought, well, what's the least amount of surgery we can do for this patient to, re, to rebalance the spine achieve stability and uh, in addition do a nice decompression. Um, this patient needs an indirect decompression and stabilization, not so much a posterior decompression. And you can see we got a nice um, uh, result from going lateral um, and then uh, putting in posterior fixation. Um, and this just illustrates the, um, the power of uh, being able to go through um, a lateral approach. And uh, again, here's the patient's X or, uh, CT scan at, at six months. You can see we still have good alignment um, and um, uh, both in, uh, there's a nice scalp film there that demonstrates um, the uh, alignment um, and a good lateral uh, CT scan as well. Here's another patient who had, um, uh, was in her 80s. She had uh, adult, um, uh, Deformity correction um, as a child was brace casted um, and now presents with basically um, adjacent level disease. Her main complaint, and you could see here on the CT scan, was radiculopathy. Um, uh, the radiculopathy was um, resistant to conservative management, um, and uh, she's had. Uh, she had multiple injections and EMGs, um, and she's starting to get progressive neurologic um, uh, deficit um, with uh, um, compression of the L3 nerve root. And you can see how, how significant both in a coronal and sagittal plane her deformity is. And again, she's in her 80s. You know, um, you can see how far forward she's tilted. I didn't want to do um, a, uh, and she didn't want it either. Um, she didn't want to have a, a T4 to pelvis or a very large corrective procedure. Her main complaint was uh, lumbar radiculopathy. So after careful review of her imaging, both her CT scan um, and uh, MRI, uh, we discussed doing a lateral procedure. And again, her main uh, areas of um, deformity are between L2, 3, and L3, 4. And you can see that here, she's got a, a, a coronal uh, uh, segmental uh, problem um, and she's got severe compression of that nerve root. You can see how much it's being compressed. So, and here's an AP image of that area. And you can see there's, she, again, um, no question, this patient has a significant problem. She's, she's older um, and did not want to have a major operation. So how about going lateral? Why not consider doing indirect decompression? Um, and, uh, and that's what we did. We put nice inner body devices into these um, uh, disc spaces. 
um, you can see that here. Um, and uh, here's the end result. And you can see, okay, um, you know, we didn't, this isn't perfect. Um, she's still got significant amount of coronal imbalance. Um, she's got, still has some positive, positive sagittal balance, but her leg pain went away. Um, and uh, you can see the power of, of um, going lateral and you can see that indirect decompression that was performed of the nerve root. Her pain was gone uh, immediately after this operation. Here's another case where, um, again, when you're doing lateral surgery, you really have to understand the anatomy. This is a patient who's got, um, if you look at her plain x-rays um, and compare it to her MRI, you have to understand the levels. Um, you have to understand the relationship of the disc space to the iliac crest. You also have to understand um, that um, in someone who's got a sacralized lumbar vertebral body or rudimentary disc, or um, some other um, uh, uh, radiographic um, abnormality that you're not gonna see on an MRI. I try to get CT scans, plain x-rays, and MRIs in all these cases. I try to look at the axial, the coronal, um, understanding the relationship between the aorta, the psoas muscle, the iliac crest, all these um, are very important when you're doing lateral surgery. Um, and uh, again, um, here's a case that um, uh, of another case that you can see where the iliac crest is completely covering the L45 disc space. And by um, uh, some intraoperative um, positioning techniques, taking the iliac crest, breaking the bed, you're able to pull down the crest a little bit. Um, but it's still an issue. So um, there's uh, newer retractor systems that you can use. We've got angled instruments that you can use. And so you have to think about, um, you know, these different things that can come up. Sometimes you don't anticipate them when you see the patient in the clinic, but if you get, if you study the x-rays, get a nice CT scan, you can anticipate, for example, in this case, that we knew L45 was gonna be difficult. Um, and so we had to use angle instruments, curettes, box cutters. This is a retractor. You can see the angle that we're going in is quite steep. The reason for that is because this angle is resting on the iliac crest. And so when you go um, from a lateral approach, um, uh, you have to use angled instruments to get in that disk space because you're not going to be able to get to that area. This is a um, lateral image showing you exactly the retractor placement, you can see that the posterior blade is in the posterior wall. Um, and this is the end result. Um, you can see an inner body cage there. And now we're going to the L34 level. Here's another case um, that I thought would de demonstrate um, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, approach of um, being able to use lateral and uh, revision cases. Um, again, um, you know, if you, uh, this is a patient who had a posterior T lift, um, and then, uh, she was approximately, um, four or five weeks out and then comes back to the emergency room with posterior displacement of a T lift cage. You know, could you go back in, <clears throat> take this out from the back? Um, for sure. She previously had, um, a dural CSF leak. Um, with the initial operation, had a lumbar drain, was in the hospital for um, almost a week. And so I didn't want to go in from the back. So I discussed with her the possibility of going in from a lateral approach. Um, and that's what we did here. <coughs> we went in laterally, took an osteotome and a cob and uh, loosened the cage up. And um, most of the companies now have nice little retriever instruments. This is a little uh, hook that we use to place it under the cage. Um, we're able to take the cage out and do the corrective procedure. Um, here's another example of a case that I uh, have done. So how about using this for tumor cases? 
um, and uh, um, how about trying to get access to the um, L4 vertebral body from a lateral approach? As many of you, uh, of you know, doing an anterior L4 carpectomy is not easy. You've got the iliac vein, iliac artery. You have um, the um, uh, different vascular structures. Getting access to that area can be quite difficult and challenging. How about going lateral? So this is a tumor case that I did recently. You can see here, we're able to get a nice corpectomy, get a nice expandable inner body cage. And this is a patient with metastasis um, and uh, was able to go home relatively quickly um, from this lateral approach. Um, and again, um, we're able to get a very nice um, reception um, and a nice inner body cage uh, was in such a place. Um, <clears throat> this is an excellent approach for trauma cases. This is an unstable uh, burst fracture. Um, and uh, what about accessing the thoracolumbar spine from a lateral approach? Again, historically, we've done these large incisions um, for these approaches and uh, having to coordinate with an access surgeon. What about just being able to go in um, and uh, take out the fractured posterior wall, which I did in this case, <clears throat> and do it from a minimally invasive approach, not having to use an uh, access surgeon and make the incision. <clears throat> you can actually see it here. The incision was quite small. And you can see how far posterior we were able to go. We put in a very nice um, inner body um, uh, expandable uh, cage. We got good restoration of the um, uh, uh, L1 vertebral body um, and good fixation posterior. So you're able to do shorter constructs, get a significant amount of correction um, and um, with minimal disruption. Here's another case um, that I did. You know, this patient had, this shows, this is an excellent example of showing how important it is to get um, anterior column support. The anterior column and the lumbar spine and the thoracic lumbar junction has been shown um, over numerous studies, uh, both in the trauma literature <coughs> and the deformity literature that's a very important there's very important biomechanical um, concepts here. You can't just do a posterior fixation alone. Um, a lot of times these patients need realignment, stabilization. The anterior column provides an excellent footprint um, and ignoring that um, sometimes can get you in trouble. This is a case where someone just went in, put in, they thought they could put in um, large screws and large rods and stabilize the spine. You can see here the rods have uh, more or less uh, pulled out and the deformity is worse. Here, um, again, another uh, excellent example of these biomechanical concepts. What about <clears throat> approaching this from the back? You could, you can go multiple levels and do a traditional corpectomy. What about going in from the front? <laughs> putting a lateral plate on, doing a corpectomy, and then coming back in <clears throat> and doing a posterior reconstruction. That's what we did there. And again, um, the picture on the one side, this is one of my cases from approximately 15 years ago. <clears throat> Using an access surgeon, you can see there's how many different retractors that are there. We've taken down the diaphragm, the lung's been dropped, um, and look how large the incision is. Um, and versus the incision on the patient on the on the patient um, left side, um, I'd much rather have a small incision. It's quicker. Um, it's uh, much easier to um, uh, deal with. And again, you do a big approach like this, and typically you don't need this much exposure for what we're doing. Um, but because of the difficulty in getting the space, um, we oftentimes had to do all these things. Um, and so that's one of the advantages of, of having direct access to this area. 
is that you don't have to um, go in that, um, uh, uh, you don't have to take the lung down, you don't have to take a rib, you don't have to do this extensive operation, you can actually go behind a lot of these structures. Here's another excellent um, thoracic lumbar trauma case, and I can show you, you can go in and, and get really posterior. I oftentimes, when I do these cases, I'll put my retractor and I'll turn it so that I'm facing posterior and you can drill all that bone off um, and do it in such a way it's very controlled, use an um, operative microscope and um, get very good visualization of the dura and the um, structures here. And again, it's the same approach that you would historically do from the front. You would drill out the transverse process, the pedicle, find the neural frame and go in um, and uh, visualize the, uh, the anterior dura and work your way back. And you can see that's what I did here. Um, I placed the rat retractor on the posterior wall. We took out the entire posterior uh, cortex and the fracture got excellent reduction um, and realignment of this fracture. And again, through a very small incision in the front, um, this patient um, ended up doing excellent. Um, here's another revision case um, <clears throat> that we did. Here's a case you can see this case, this um, patient had an uh, anterior, uh, previous anterior procedure, had a large thoracal lumbar approach, and actually I went anterior to the old incision, drilled out the um, end plates, um, and uh, uh, took out the cage. You can see these are two, this is the cage going back, this is the cage cut in half, um, and we ended up putting a new device, and we tried to put in, again, the nice thing about some of the older cages were you actually put them right in the hypothesial ring so that uh, subsidence on these cages is very high. These larger cages from a lateral approach, you can see here, is a nice diagram, you can get good end plate coverage. So the risk of having a, um, <clears throat> a fracture is, um, uh, of the end plates is quite less and subsidence uh, tends to be um, uh, almost non-existent. Um, I know we're running, we're almost, I'm almost done. I've got a couple more slides and then I'll open it up to the audience for questions. This is a very large um, calcified disc. This patient you can see has had multiple approaches. She's had four different approaches to take care of this problem. She had progressive myelopathy. You see a very large calcified disc. And again, um, do you want to go back in and do the fourth operation, fifth operation from the back, deal with scar tissue? And your access is not that great. So why not consider going anterior? That's what I did on this patient. Um, you can see that this is quite adherent to the dura. Um, and so why not go in and try to just, just drill off that posterior wall and leave that structure in place. There's no point in trying to take this calcified piece off. It's been there for years. Um, so here's an intraoperative view showing my approach. I placed a retractor on the disc space. I drilled out the posterior wall and I just left that calcified disc um, in the inner space. Um, and you can see my, uh, I drilled a nice trough posteriorly um, and decompressed the uh, central canal. This was done from a lateral approach. Again, um, it was in the thoracic spine, so I dropped the lung. I went behind the diaphragm, went behind the chest wall, got a very uh, nice decompression, did not have to put a chest tube in, made a very small incision, um, and uh, did not have to manipulate the cord at all. Basically, just drilled out the, um, the end plates and the bone. Um, here's an, uh, another metastatic case. This is a patient who had uh, metastasis with a lumbar um, uh, L3 metastasis with retropulsion. You can see the significant amount of retropulsion that's present. So we went in, took out the entire vertebral body, um, got good, got excellent reconstruction of the um, lumbar uh, um, uh, lordosis and was able to put a nice um, inner body device and got good anterior column support. 
and uh, went um, then went posterior and stabilized the spine. Um, this is uh, again, this is that exact. This is the same exact case you can see here. The um, uh, uh, sorry, this is a separate case, but same level L3 um, corpectomy. And again, we're able to go. Um, we put a short segmental fixation at the corpectomy site, and then went one above and one below. And um, you know, we've recently written up our, uh, this is 15 years of work. Um, uh, we recently uh, wrote up our entire um, series and um, we're able to work uh, with Tima. Um, and uh, uh, this is a lot of work that went in. Um, we just recently wrote this textbook on the approach. Um, and uh, you can see here, we, we're trying to change a lot of the anatomical diagrams that are out in the literature. Um, this nicely shows the lumbar um, plexus and how it actually goes through the uh, psoas muscle. Um, and uh, uh, we spend a lot of time, um, uh, there's some very nice illustrations in this book that discuss um, some of the things that I um, talked about. And um, I wanna thank everybody, including the committee, um, for allowing me to participate um, and present my work. And I'm gonna go ahead and now open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Dr. Squiam, for such a wonderful lecture. Um, I'm sure all the audience has learned from your last experience. So right now we have a few questions from the public. Hmm. First question is, in which cases do you perform posterior orthopesis additionally to anterior fusion? Um, so most of the cases that I do, I mean, it's pretty rare. I've done um, some, uh, uh, you know, I've done some standalone uh, lateral approaches, but um, uh, it's less and less um, and you mo almost, I would say a significant amount of the surgeries that we do, we often go posterior, so. Okay. Do you usually perform trans-soas approaches rather than anterior mm -hmm. soas approaches? In which cases you would perform anterior soas over trans-soas? So um, that's an excellent question. I would say that most of the approaches I do are trans-soas. I think now um, I'm doing uh, more, thinking more and more of, um, you know, uh, especially going prone. When we go prone trans, uh, uh, prone trans psoas, especially in four or five, you can really go anterior of the psoas. Most of the time now, though, in my uh, technique currently, it's almost exclu exclusively trans psoas. Okay. In which cases you would prefer to do an anterior psoas rather than some psoas? Or you can do all of those? Um, I think probably, I mean, if you're gonna do um, uh, a answer the psoas, I think probably four or five is the level to do it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that five one is where I'd wanna go um, answer the psoas. Um, I think uh, for me, five one, either an OLIF or an ALIF is a reasonable approach. Okay, thank you. Mm. Which are your recommendations to reduce the steep learning curve in advanced approaches to the spine? Boy, that's an excellent question. I think spending time in the lab, um, I think, uh, you know, the more exposure you can get to um, uh, be able to actually work on um, this and cadavers, um, you know, uh, I think, just practice is really the only way I can see overcoming the steep learning curve. Thank you. Do the advanced approaches to the spine increase the treatment related costs in comparison with traditional posterior approaches? You know, that's an excellent question. Um, I do think there's this, I don't, I don't know that the answer to that. Um, I do think, obviously, um, 
you know, once you start looking at the cost, the companies are very good at, you know, they they are uh, masters of marketing and, um, you know, these lateral implants are not cheap. I think they're more expensive than posterior. So I don't think you save any money um, by going in from the front. I think they're, um, the patient probably has less um, morbidity in terms of the incision, um, but I think the cost is probably more. What do you consider is the ideal field for endoscopic lumbar interbody fusion? Um, so I, this question is um, a little bit uh, challenging, but I, I'm trying to figure out what they mean by ideal field. Um, the ideal case is the um, ideal case. Um, uh, yeah. You know, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't do a lot of endoscopic surgery, but I think there's a role for endoscopic surgery. There's no question. Um, I don't know if you can go from a lateral approach because then you would be filling up the retroperitoneum with a bunch of fluid. Um, I think you know, when you do endoscopic surgery, there's lots of, um, they use lots of fluid to irrigate the space, but it's kind of confined. Um, and so, you know, in the lumbar spine, it's a little bit different. Um, whereas I think in the, and if you go retroperitoneum, I don't know if you can do um, a, uh, I guess, I mean, that's, a, that's, that's something I think, you know, um, Definitely, we can we can say I would say there's an opportunity there, but I don't know anybody doing lateral endoscopic surgery. Okay, what is your opinion about robotic lumbar interbody fusion? Um, you know, I think the robot is going to get more and more um, uh, play. I think it's going to get a lot more. Um, you know, it's like robotic. You know, now they have, they're going to have self-driving vehicles. So I think it's the future. Um, I don't think it's quite there yet. You know, I still think we're in, it's in, in the infancy. So um, I think there's, there, it remains to be seen, but I'm impressed by what these companies have done in a very short amount of time. In superotic patients, what strategies you offer to avoid pseudoarthrosis? or subsidence of intersomatic cages? Um, <clears throat> say that question again. It says in osteoporotic patients, got it. Yes. Um, boy, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, I think osteoporotic patients are very challenging. I think you can Sometimes we've had to do kyphoplasty, vertebral plasties on them. Um, I think when you go lateral, there's less chance for having these issues, but you're still dealing with poor bone. So they, we still can have complications um, with osteoporotic fractures. No question about it. Okay, thanks. Do you use lateral approaches for the treatment of vertebral osteomyelitis? If so, how much time one should wait for performing decompression and instrument fusion in case indicated due to its instability? Um, so I use it all the time, and it's an it's a extremely valuable um, tool to be able to do, and I don't think you need to wait. Um, I think those patients do very well with fusions. I think you have to, with infections, you have to get source control and you have to get in there and debride the infection. Um, in fact, for lumbar discitis osteomyelitis, it's perfect because a lot of times these patients have psoas abscesses that need to be drained. And so um, we've done that a lot. In the acute phase. Yeah, yeah. In fact, we published it um, with a very nice article in the Journal of Neurosurgery about this particular topic. So. Okay, thank you. On average, what is the duration of a transoas approach for the experienced spine surgeon? What radiation dose is received per case? 
um, <clears throat> which say that once again. On average, what is the duration, the length of a transverse approach for the experienced spine surgeon? And what radiation dose is received per case? Uh, so the answer to the first question, I would say um, that's, um, it varies. <clears throat> In my experience, let's say if I were to do a one level interbody fusion, I could do it in about, safely in about 15 minutes. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know what the, that's a, the radiation exposure is an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that one. <coughs> okay, thank you. Which type of interoperative neurophysiologic monitoring is preferred in order to avoid lumbar plexus lesions? Where do you place the source probe? Um, <clears throat> Say that last part one more time. So which type of interoperative neuromonitoring is preferred in these lateral cases to avoid lumbar plexus lesions? And where do you place that? Yeah, so, um, uh, so I think the neuromonitoring, I think any neuromonitoring you use is fine. I don't have a preference of one company over the other. <clears throat> I do think that Understanding free run EMGs, understanding, you know, the knowing what to look for is more important than um, the, uh, the actual device. Um, understanding anatomy is the most important thing. So if you understand you're at L45, this is where the nerve most likely is going to be. That's way more important than than anything a neuromonitoring uh, person is going to tell you. So I would say understanding anatomy is, is important um, and having these other tools can help you. But um, the uh, anatomy is what, what all, the all the time will win over anything else. Okay. And the last question is, in cases of thoracolumbar junction fractures, as the one you showed, how many levels you recommend for posterior arthrodesis, additionally to anterior fusion? You know, that's an excellent question. I think it's each patient is different. I think it depends on the mechanism of injury. Um, is it a, um, is it a trauma? Is there other, you know, is there posterior elements involved? Um, is there osteoporosis? So I think for each case, it's very different. I think um, for me, if I have a significant trauma and there's um, a, a chance fracture or something like that, I don't hesitate to go two levels above and two levels below. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. On, on behalf of CN, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Skuyan. This has been a wonderful lecture and a wonderful question and answer session. We are really grateful and honored for your participation in the 2021 IWBNC. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, being able to be involved and, um, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing all the excellent talks that are still left. Of course. For all the audience, keep in mind this lecture will be available on our website starting next week. And in a few minutes, we'll have Dr. Juan Uribe doing his lecture, Single Position Prone Lateral Interbody Fusion. To get the link for this upcoming conference, please follow the link pinned here in the chat or just check the program schedule on our website, cnhoos.com. Thank you.